Um, so it's me again to give you a brief update about the state of the DHT content routing through some of the measurements that we've been doing. Um, which the, the title might be a little bit misleading to what I have in the content actually, uh, which is going to focus on the second and third bullet point of that list. So there have been several major developments. Um, Steve gave an update earlier on about the, uh, what Kubo is, what has been uh, the latest focus of the team, uh, and what's the roadmap. Um, some major developments there have been uh, the resource manager, which I'm definitely not the right person to talk about this, so no questions answered about this if you had any. Um, and uh, I'm going to focus on two events or incidents that um, the Probla team was quite involved uh, together, of course, with the uh, IP stewards teams. One was the Hydra dial down, and the second was um, a, an incident that uh, we faced when um, a large part of the network became unresponsive in early 2023. And finally, I'll give some of the current stats about what we're seeing uh, in terms of DHT performance through our measurements. Um, and it would be great if you had more insights or if you played around to kind of cross check and see, you know, if our results match or not, or how can we do better. Uh, so Hydra dial down. So this all goes back to, um, okay, yeah, to IPFS CAM 2022, where we, uh, we had the presentation there. But I'll start by, you know, uh, Hydras in a nutshell. Maybe not everyone is aware of what Hydras are. Uh, basically, uh, a Hydra is a giant IPFS node with many different heads, like many different appearances within the hash space. Uh, this is about 2,000 different um, kind of heads or uh, points of presence, if we can put it this way, in the hash space, and they have a common provider record store. Uh, so when they hear about the provider record, they put it in the, into a common uh, database. So what, what's the purpose of doing that? Uh, the main purpose was to have faster access to provider records. Uh, the, the number there of uh, two, whoop, of 2000 um, is not chosen randomly. Um, it's chosen so that when someone is uh, publishing a provider record to 20 other peers in the network, the intention was that one of them should definitely be a Hydra booster. So that you have at least one stable node um, that stores uh, a record in the network is normally up and therefore can serve it quickly when someone requests it. So that was done back in, um, I don't know when, I think 2019. Um, and that was a time when um, the DHT was not even um, uh, making any difference between clients and servers, uh, distinguishing between clients and servers. So everyone would be a potential server for content and provide the records. And of course, with NATs and all that, you can imagine that it was a big mess. So it was helping, definitely helping uh, a lot at the, uh, in the beginning. I, I haven't seen any uh, numbers, but I'm sure that the, uh, the performance difference back then was much bigger than it was today. Um, so this is the main functionality of uh, Hydras, or at least what they were brought in life to do. Uh, lately, they're bridging uh, also services between uh, IPFS and uh, Filecoin through indexer nodes and so on. Uh, so, you know, there is that part as well, and that's why they're kind of still alive. Now, in Q3 of 22, we started a, um, a study to see actually what is the performance boost that they, uh, that they provide. And interestingly, interestingly, we found out that it's, it's actually not that much. We found out that it's uh, between like around 10%, like as we see in this uh, graph, is between eight at the 95th percentile to 13 at the 50th percentile, um, which, which is good, but not great, assuming well, taking into consideration that they have a huge monetary cost in order to run them, right? You're running 2,000 nodes that are sending and receiving a lot of traffic and also storing billions of provider records. 
even, even though provider records are pretty small files, you still have a billion of them. Um, well, m maybe more. Uh, so the decision was taken uh, collectively among a few uh, teams at Protocol Labs and beyond that um, we should at least try to dial them down and see if things are going to break, if things are according to the expectation here, around 10% of a performance slowdown. Um, and that's what we did. So we've communicated uh, the details to the community through this uh, discussion forum post. Of course, you know, uh, the, the intention was communicated already from uh, October and November in, uh, at IPFS camp. Uh, but we, um, yeah, we communicate the community so that everyone is aware of the intention. Um, we've set up monitoring, which I'm going to come to it in a bit in order to know what we're getting into and what's happening in reality. And then we've yeah, indicated points of contact, of course. IPFS, as you know, is a like totally open network. People might use it for reasons and applications that we're not even aware of. Uh, and therefore, someone might have been you know, more dependent on Hydras than we thought others would be. Um, so, if that were the case, then maybe someone's service would just basically die out uh, at that moment. Um, so, yeah, um, we've provided all that, and then um, we've set up this monitoring infrastructure, where we, which we still kind of have to measure several different things. Um, and we have um, the fleet of controlled nodes or probes that I mentioned earlier this morning, where we have the HD servers that publish new CADs. Um, first of all, we set up nodes around the globe. Um, DHD, they're all DHD servers. They, um, they publish new CADs out of random content, so no one else knows about it. Uh, then they communicate to CADs among them so that they know what is the, C the CAD that was just published. And then on the other side, the rest of them, they are going and requesting that random CAD. Uh, obviously, because they're random data, this is nowhere cached in the network, so no one else knows about that. Um, and therefore, we kind of um, uh, interacting with the live network in a, in a seamless way. Um, yeah, so w we set up the experiment and, you know, we've been running this well before uh, just to see how fast the, the performance is. And we wanted to go, you know, we turn off the hydras and then we continue doing the same so that we see what's happening before and after. And um, the actual performance that we've um, found for, for the first week was that basically it was around about what we thought just a little bit higher. So it would go up to, in some cases, 27% we've seen. So this is the aggregate here uh, out of all of the locations. I have to say that um, something that requires uh, a deeper look into, which I uh, would be very happy to work on with uh, some of you in the future, is that we see different performance from different geographic locations, like massively different. Um, th things are much faster from, um, uh, from EU nodes or US East and West nodes uh, compared to the rest. There are a few potential explanations. We don't have um, yeah, all the data to support what we think, uh, but this is subject to future work. So this is the aggregate. Things were very different. The, the, the performance difference was close to zero, for those fast locations, for EU-based uh, clients and US-based clients, uh, but it was high, a little bit higher than we expected. Um, what we kind of think the performance difference is, this extra five to 10, seven, 10 percent, is that high, like the moment we turned off the, the Hydra functionality of storing and serving provider records, what happened was that um, this node participates in the network, but doesn't store any provider record. So it's kind of less well behaved than the rest of the DHT server nodes in the network that, you know, they are there, they are pointing to other peers when, you know, when someone is requesting something, which Hydras now also do. 
but a normal DHC server would also store provider records and serve them, which the Hydras don't do. So they're less than well-behaved DHC server nodes right now because they will, as I said, point to closer peers when you ask them, but they don't store or serve any provider records. Like they've gone from knowing everything about the network to not doing anything about the network. Um, so, and if you like, if you do like a napkin calculation of, um, as I said, we've got 2,000 uh, Hydra heads right now. Uh, this is about 10% of the roughly 20, 25,000 server, DC server nodes that exist in the network. That's about 10%. So 10% of the times you'll, you'll hit a node that is basically almost useless. Um, and therefore, you have 10% chances of having an extra hop because you'll, you'll never get a provider record from the Hydra as they are right now. So what, you, what they only do, they point you closer so it's an extra DHT hop. Um, so this makes sense. It's like roughly 10% of nodes, roughly 10% of times you'll hit them and you'll get nothing back. So this is the 10% extra to what we had seen before. Um, so that's where we ended up. Down there is the cost. Um, it went down significantly. It stayed in the middle for a few days and then dropped, uh, dropped a lot more. So um, yeah, we kind of went to the result that we wanted. We, kind, we have, especially if we turn them off completely at some point, which is a point of discussion for one of the working sessions here um, later next week, uh, we're going to get the roughly 10% performance hit with no um, monetary cost to pay uh, anymore about you know, maintaining hydras. So that was an interesting time, interesting experiment. Um, yeah, there, there are a lot more results in the discussion forum post that I have uh, linked before. And now um, let's get to the other part, which uh, happened in January 2021, uh, perhaps a little bit before, but we were not aware. Um, so we realized around the 10th of January that uh, there is some problem because this error um, is showing up uh, pretty often when, when trying to provide content to the network. Um, well, and not only. So uh, several of our team members were, see, were seeing that, uh, didn't know exactly what was uh, going on with this. Um, in, coincidentally, we had uh, a team meeting, so we were physically, some of us were physically together. Um, and uh, yeah, I forgot to include the ni that nice picture, but a few people gathered in a hotel room and stayed uh, well after midnight trying to figure out what's going on. Um, and uh, yeah, the first findings were that, you know, Basically, if you look a little bit closer into this, uh, it talks about a resource limit and, you know, by digging through the resource manager, um, it was quite easy to understand that this is a resource manager uh, issue. Uh, you know, that's the most likely thing to have happened there. Um, of course, it was a little bit tricky because the resource manager uh, was not set to um, behave in this way. And therefore, we didn't know what's happened. Of course, anyone can touch the code and you know, work it out differently and have the resource, the resource manager set it to different settings. Um, and probably that's what happened. But then we had to see you know, what's going on. What's the blast radius? Who is this affecting? Which by um, a rough estimation, it was about 60% of network nodes, which was significant. Um, you know, uh, we're a little bit alarmed at that point. Okay, what does that mean? Um, and of course, what's the impact? Like which operations in the network get affected? Is it the put and get operations? Is it both? Is it some of them? Is it something else? Um, and by doing several experiments and, you know, having those experiments that I talked about uh, before going on anyway in our infrastructure, we didn't see any errors and things failing. So at least operations were, uh, were completing, which was, yeah, a, a relief at that point. You know, the, the system is not down and, you know, well, we're doing our own thing. But we had to figure out what's the latency impact. And the initial reaction to that was that it's most likely um, the put operation that is being kind of hit 
hard the hardest because you know when you when you do a put request you need to find you need to get 20 successful responses. So basically find 20 peers to store the provider record. When you try to get something from the network, you just need one person that has this and you get it back. So it's much more likely to have 20, um, to have a problem or to hit an unresponsive node when you have, you know, when you're contacting and expecting responses from 20 people rather than one. Um, and we figured out like, we tried to pick some of the peer IDs of nodes that were seen as unresponsive and tried to figure out in which um, buckets in, a, in the routing table of nodes do they sit into, do they occupy. So it turns out that they were occupying the higher um, buckets, which means that they're not the kind of most important ones that you have or the, the first ones you, you contact when you um, do a put or a get request. So it was, yeah, that, that, that was the initial thought. Um, but we had to kind of verify that because that, that was kind of uh, uh, speculation at that point. So we crawled the network, we gathered um, a, a very large group of affected nodes, nodes that were not responding. Um, which took some time, of course, but it was uh, a fun experiment. And then we had a fleet of nodes that were perform performing the put and get, and get operation that I showed previously with the several different nodes in different locations. And we, we did that like in two runs, like doing two different things. One was including all of the peers, like the network as it is, right? Like um, right now. Uh, normally, and the second one when we were uh, ignoring those affected peers, right? So to see that the intention there was, you know, what would happen if these affected nodes were not part of the network? So the difference that we would get between these two would be basically the performance hit that um, we were expecting. And the results are these ones. We found that, that uh, in terms of put performance and publication time, um, it was between, yeah, 9 and 15 percent, the, the performance hit. So the blue bar is when taking everyone in the network into account and, you know, interacting with everyone that is present. And the red bar is without. So if we exclude the nodes that we've seen being unresponsive, what would be that, the case then? And we found these results. Um, for the get latency, the results were, were actually, we figured out that um, get requests are affected more than put requests, which is between 7 and 19.5-20%, um, uh, which was a bit of an alarm because, you know, um, it, it is a significant, well, significant, it is a sizable uh, performance cost, which would come, like in January, it would come on top of the 10 to 15% of uh, performance costs that we're paying by turning off hydras, right? So suddenly within the, uh, within the window of two months, the, the network would become, I don't know, maybe 30, maybe 40% slower um, because of these two events. So it, it was, the, the, there needed to be some decisions to be made. So, okay, um, around the end of January and, well, part of it was end of January, then beginning of February, uh, of course, we had to stop the bleeding, which uh, meant that the, uh, the stewards team, the APFS stewards, um, it was decided that there is another release of Kubo, the 018.1, uh, that was putting some better defaults into the resource manager and changing a few other bits and pieces that would make it more difficult for other you know, operators, DHT operators, and like either servers or clients to fall into this trap and make the same mistake. So we encourage the community to upgrade. Um, yeah, the, the updated release was uh, really was out on the 30th of January. Uh, within, luckily, within a few days, there were quite a few, like in the order of eight or eight to ten thousand nodes upgraded to this release. So. Um, um, yeah, performance got back to normal pretty quickly, as we we're going to see. Uh, and we had to monitor the put and get performance, like before the release and after the release, as nodes started upgrading. 
Um, and obviously, we wanted to get a, a feeling of, you know, how long do we have to go until we get back to pre-incident levels? And that's why that's why we measured the, uh, you know, the with and without is similar to the the graph that I showed earlier. Basically, we wanted this uh, percentage there to get closer to zero, uh, because that would mean that many of the affected nodes have now upgraded, and therefore, you know, the, the performance that we're seeing um, is not, um, is back to, to kind of normal. So, um, yeah, so, <laughs> the, this is the, um, after about eight, maybe a little bit more than 8,000, I think, nodes upgraded, the, the difference that we've seen is immediately very big. So the blue is before the release, when a, lo a large percentage of nodes were, were not upgraded, and the post is when nodes started upgrading. So within 10 days, basically, there was a 30 to 40, 40 something percent improvement in the performance that we're seeing compared to what was happening before, right? So even when only Eight to ten thousand, like half the network upgraded. We've seen already half of the uh, performance being kind of taken back, so to speak. So we continued doing that, and then in terms of you know where are we compared to pre-incident levels, we continued monitoring that until there was a um, yeah just three, four, five percent of difference compared to the set of peer IDs that we have, we had with affected nodes. So at that point, I think we said, okay, we're now back to almost pre-incident levels. I think there is another graph that I couldn't find that uh, the, the numbers are, are even smaller. Um, and we kind of left it to that because we are now seeing that a lot of nodes are, have upgraded to this V018 um, release. Right, so lessons learned out of this. Um, you know, th there were some significant updates uh, with the resource manager, and when that happens, we need to have clear documentation, announcements, and recommendations to um, to, to to node operators, basically, uh, just to let them know what should be done, what is not recommended to be done. Uh, there should be clear communication channels, which this is the case. I mean, there's a discussion forum, there's Discord, there's you know. Uh, the Slack uh, workspace and all that. So um, much of what is mentioned here is done anyway. Uh, I think in these incidents, documentation could be a little bit improved. Uh, and then uh, we should have monitoring software, which we kind of didn't have at the time so much established. Uh, but you know, it should always be in place in order to catch those spikes in, uh, in performance. However, uh, the good news is that, you know, despite this uh, big disruption of 60% of nodes being out of action, basically, the network didn't go down, all operations were completing su successfully, um, all content was disco discoverable, and yeah, to, to the present day, we haven't heard of reports that, you know, some application was not working or some system fell apart, no one reached out either publicly or um, uh, privately to, to tell us something like that, which was great news. And I mean, again, it's like uh, the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, and distributed nature of IPFS that I think um, got us to this point. It wouldn't be too easy otherwise. Um, of course, there was a clear performance hit that is also, um, if, if we see, if we go and see this graph, with, uh, which go, dates back to um, 2021 or uh, early 2022, which is the fine time. Um, anyway, the, there are some small issues with this script, but generally gives an idea. And we can see there the big bump uh, at the beginning of 2023, where performance like hit, um, uh, performance shot up very, uh, very suddenly. So um, we can see that this is when the Hydra was dialed down, and we see like uh, an increase perhaps that is eased you to the Hydra, perhaps. Like I would say around here, this is uh, the new default that was down 
uh, there during 2022. Uh, and then performance start, uh, like started going up, latency started going up until the new release was out, which is at roughly at this point at the end of January, uh, when we see a sudden like um, drop. And this is roughly where we are today. Uh, so I think we're back to seeing uh, this, you know, this difference, which is around the 10% that we were expecting before dial down, dialing down the, uh, the hydras, getting back to that. Um, yeah, we, which proves the experiments that we've done, but uh, of course we need to keep on monitoring for the longer term. Um, so here is the performance, um, the, the P50 and P90 from what we're seeing as a, like from time to first provide the record. Uh, and what I wanted to highlight here is what I mentioned beforehand that we're seeing uh, hugely different performance between different locations. So you see that you know uh, the EU node and the US East and US West node, they have very much different um, performance than the rest of the regions. And that's both P50, P90, and P99 that we are um, that we are monitoring. Um, there is lots to be speculated, but uh, at some point we need to. Uh, I don't know, sit down and figure out what, why this happens. There are several different um, um, justifications that could be, um, you know, uh, valid, but we don't know exactly which one. Um, so uh, we're measuring the DHT lookup performance, as I said, uh, both like in the graph and uh, in numbers. Um, the DHT servers versus clients, the last couple of weeks, uh, we see that, uh, okay, here the, the, um, the pink one is the DHT client, the blue one is the DHT servers, and the black line is the number of IP addresses where we see uh, nodes connecting from. Uh, so we see that the, like, the number of both DHT servers and clients was very much increased in the beginning of the year, um, and then we see a, a clear decline. However, we don't see the same in terms of IP addresses, and if you go to our weekly reports, you're going to f see that for those weeks there when there is a peak, there were many nodes that were rotating their peer IDs very often, uh, and that would make for, of course, very many uh, appearing as very many peers having entered and been in the network, but in reality, um, out of calculations, I think um, some some nodes were rotating their peer IDs as often as once every two or five minutes. So, right, you, you cannot be useful to the network if you rotate your peer ID every, anything less than 10 minutes. I mean, the routing table refresh is every 10 minutes. So anything you do in between, you don't have really very accurate information. So, um, yeah, so, so lots of nodes that were not really contributing to the network uh, during that time. and. It seems that since the, IP, the number of IP addresses stays the same, is basically, you know, there isn't too much worry about, you know, the network size shrinking. It's just becoming, the nodes that we have in the network becoming more stable. Uh, and if you see our weekly reports in, um, in terms of online nodes versus offline nodes versus what we call mostly online and offline nodes, it's becoming the, the ratio of online nodes is now the largest percentage, which is, which is great news, basically. Um, ah, there it is, yeah. Uh, so we've seen like these are offline nodes that uh, again it's mostly during that period and now it's shrinking a lot and the vast majority of like the largest percentage of nodes that we see in the network are stable um, online nodes which we define online as being um, online for more than 80% of time throughout an entire week uh, right continuously uh, which is pretty good percentage I would say uh, right, uh, again, for a third time today, uh, if you want to figure out, uh, to, to find these numbers, you've got two places to go now, but soon uh, just one, uh, especially for the problab.io page, uh, go have a look, let us know what you think, uh, it's still under development, so um, yeah, it's the right time to give us feedback and see, and tell us what would be interesting to include there from your point of view, because um, yeah, that's how we're going to make it as useful as possible to uh, to everyone. Uh, yeah, and that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, <laughs> happy.
happy to take questions. Da, da, da. Just a bit of a, a sarcastic comment, perhaps. But, um, the, uh, the spike you saw in uh, February, March. Huh? Yeah. Um, so, to what extent can these like uh, abnormalities or spikes be explained by people trying to measure the network? So, is experiments on the network actually making it harder to measure the network? <laughs> Uh, if, we, if we're uh, shooting ourselves in the foot, you mean? <laughs> um, uh, no, I don't. I don't think we're we're interacting with the network, but we're not. Um, we're not doing any action that would mean would bring less stability to the network. We're just interacting as if it was just an application that was running, you know, similarly to someone hosting a website or um, requesting a website, you know, the, uh, from the network or just a file. Um, the uh, performance, like what we do is pretty similar to that. So it wouldn't hurt performance. Cool, other questions? Yeah. You mentioned that like the cycling through different PIDs or like joining the network again with a different ID uh, is mostly due to the flawed uh, yeah, software or instable node. Um, now it significantly went down, but are there, can you measure the amount of uh, people doing this like for privacy reasons, uh, frequently, like purposely cycling through different PIDs and not when they are breaking down or losing connectivity, but like on a fix every five minute interval or something like that? Right, yeah. Um, so first of all, just to clarify that um, this spike there in offline nodes, I, I'm not sure, I don't think it's related to the incident with the resource manager mm -hmm. that I was talking about before. Okay. Uh, maybe it is, I don't know. It's very difficult to find out. And to be honest, we didn't even look that deep. We, we didn't want to, uh, it was not of interest to get into that level. Mm -hmm. um, so why someone would rotate through peer IDs and um, yeah, what's the purpose? I don't know. Uh, it, it is very likely that, you know, for, privacy reasons, although I'm failing to see what would the what would the point be because you know you might be able to it might make sense to do that as a DHT client mm -hmm. but not as a DHT server. Because if you're a DHT server and you're assuming you want to hide something, say that you're publishing and hosting some C A D, right? And you publish it and then you rotate your peer ID to something else you're not achieving anything because then you have a new peer ID, so they can, people cannot find you. Sure. So your content is not reachable anymore. So if you think about it, I don't know if there is even any privacy um, uh, advantage. Uh, yeah, but we haven't, we haven't looked deeper into this. Okay. Yeah. Is that the reason for, yeah, yeah. Uh, the reason for the attacks, like Eclipse attack, that's why they're rotating the peer ID to try to... Um, uh, it could be, uh, yeah. Uh, it, c it could be someone trying to eclipse some uh, node or CAD. Uh, it could be the case. We, again, we haven't seen any reports out of our own experiments or out of, you know, other people's like, you know, something not being reachable or something. Um, but yeah, th that could be the case. 